All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, Fridays with Grant. My name is Mike Mobius, and I'm the president of the Civil War Roundtable Congress, and we are very happy to, uh, to have you with us tonight with uh, uh, the President Grant at the Grant College. Your audio has been muted, and we would love for that to be remain uh, muted throughout the rest of the evening. And I'm going to also ask that you turn off your video. And the way that you do that is that in the lower left-hand corner of your Zoom window. Interestingly enough, it says stop video. If you'll click that, that will help us to conserve our bandwidth. Uh, there are, you know, in a remote situation, especially on uh, Mount McGregor, there are issues. We are going to be using the chat feature to do the question and answer. And tonight is a live presentation of your questions and, and um, Kurt's answers. So uh, we're going to use that chat feature. Chat is an icon on your Zoom window just to the left of the green button. Click that now and make sure that it says everyone so we can all read your questions and your comments. We would love for you to invite uh, Kurt Fields to your roundtable or other Civil War or post-Civil War uh, 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 event. And you do that by sending him an email to Kurt Fields, one word, at generalgrantbyhimself.com. We would like for you to like us and follow us on our Facebook page, to subscribe to our YouTube channel, and thank you so very much to every one of our donors. Let's see if I can do this right. Here we go. Tonight is the Warriors question and answer redo. And so your question should just uh, be about um, 1861 through 1865. And um, by the way, we do have other programs coming up. Next Friday is a redo of uh, Kurt Fields behind the curtain, and he and I will be uh, putting our heads together for May 21st and May 28th, so don't despair. So uh, let's let's go to the uh, to the chat. Uh, come on, chat. And uh, here we go. So uh, Sue Ann says, hello, everyone. Hope you are all well. Looking forward to General Grant, as always. Jerry says, where is this place where the general died? It is uh, the Drexel Cottage on Mount McGregor, New York, in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York. Uh, I'm about three hours, as I understand, uh, northwest of New York City. And uh, uh, it's in Wilton, the village of Wilton, W-I-L-T-O-N, Wilton, New York. And you can uh, research it as the uh, Grant Cottage, or the, uh, it would be most easily done, Grant Cottage, the McGregor Cottage but it's upstate New York. Robert says, uh, Grant spent summers at Elberon, New Jersey. What months did he spend in New York? He lived in New York from eight, or I lived in New York from 18, see, I left the White House in 77. We were in Philadelphia, then we, went on a two and a half year round the world cruise, came back in the fall of uh, 79, almost 80, and then moved to New York City. And we lived in New York City for the next uh, four years at uh, number three, East 66th Street. It was a four story brownstone home uh, right off Fifth Avenue and across from Central Park, uh, the new Central Park. And uh, so I, I spent year round here we had a summer home 
in uh, Burlington, New Jersey, uh, and we would stay there in Long Branch, New Jersey too. Had a cottage on the shore, 28 room cottage on the shore at Long Branch, New Jersey. And that's where we summered uh, during my White House years and uh, afterward till we, until we bought the house on uh, number three, East 66th Street, and then we moved to New York City. Uh, Mike Hoover says that it looks cold there. It is cold here. Uh, I am wearing my civilian clothing, uh, my presidential clothing, and uh, it feels very nice. I've got a heavy scarf here and a shawl that was doubled and about my uh, neck. And uh, I've got, see, I can do this. I've got my house shoes on, my slippers, my famous I think they've come to be my famous slippers that are seen in a photograph or two of me. And they feel very nice too. The temperature is in the low 50s and falling like the proverbial stone. Uh, and I don't have my old great coat with me. So about the time we get through with our meeting tonight, I'll be uh, seeking warmer quarters and put another log on the fire. Indeed you will. Uh, Sue Ann says, so touching to think that we saw the view that Grant was seen before he died. I wanted you to see that. I hope that uh, this new descendant of Brady's cameras uh, wasn't moved too fast, that you got a, a satisfying look. Uh, as I sit here looking out over the overlock uh, that I saw the last day that I was here and um, it's a thrill to be here. I urge all of you to come at some point. It, even if you can't come, look it up, become a friend of this organization, uh, like the page that they've got, whatever that is. I'm sure I don't know what a Facebook is, but they keep talking about Facebook something around here. And uh, become an, involved, at least knowledgeably with this place. Help keep the flame burning. John says, I could tell by the way you were dressed and by your location where you were and what stage of Grant's life you, you were portraying. Well, it's near the end. Really near the end. <laughs> exactly. Daz says, how was your relationship with Meade when he found out about you attaching yourself to the Army of the Potomac? And did he feel undermined at any point by your presence. Daz, it's good to have you with us yet again, uh, my British friend. And, you know, ever since we got that little problem in 1812, 1814 worked out, we've been good friends. Uh, the, the relationship, oh, and also I, I monitor your telegrams and uh, I see that you do a great deal with uh, our history, our Civil War history. And that pleases me no end. Please keep it up and please keep me apprised. Uh, the relationship with Meade was uh, all right initially. And I say that a bit cautiously. I knew George Meade. And uh, he's, he's got a nickname that you, you civilians may not be aware of. Uh, uh, the old snapping turtle. He's got a big beak nose. Uh, that he's sensitive about. Don't ever tell him you got a big, big nose. Uh, he wouldn't care for it. Uh, and you might be exposed to that temper that he's famous for, but he's got a bad temper, but he's a good man. And he's a, an excellent tactician and fighter. He's a fighter and uh, he fights well. It's more than just a fighter. A courageous man can get himself killed quickly but uh, uh, by acting foolishly, he's a good fighter, good tactician and strategist. I did not want to attach myself to the Army of the Potomac, but there was no way around it. I initially had planned to have my headquarters in either Louisville or Nashville, stay in the Western Theater and command via the telegraph with, uh, remember I'm commanding more than a half a million men in some five armies. So in a, in a large sense, Daz, it doesn't matter where I was, 
but it mattered a great deal to the president. And President Lincoln made it abundantly clear to me that he wanted me in the Eastern Theater and he wanted me with the Army of the Potomac going against Lee. And my resolution to that, which worked well for a few weeks, uh, was to have my headquarters close to Meade's headquarters, not with them, uh, out of sight of Meade's headquarters. Because I told George, I don't want anyone coming to me with information that should go to you first. And I, because I'm not going to issue an order that independent of you unless contingency demands it. And I, I stayed with that throughout the rest of the, the, the year, the rest of the war. Uh, and I also did not want to be issuing or perceived as running the Army of the Potomac. You see, I'm still correcting people as gently as I may, that I was not the commander of the Army of the Potomac. I was the commander, the general in chief. I, I commanded five armies from Ben Butler, uh, bottled up on Bermuda 100, to Nathaniel Banks in Texas, the Shenandoah Valley, uh, Sherman in uh, the Western Theater in uh, Southern Eastern Tennessee, North Georgia, the Carolinas and so forth. And I'm commanding all of those armies via the telegraph. And I did it with 12 staff officers. So I didn't, I didn't attach myself with Meade until I absolutely had to. Now, after the wilderness and then Spotsylvania and then Cold Harbor. By the time we had gotten through with Cold Harbor, uh, I had migrated my headquarters over to Meade and, and there wasn't so much separation anymore. But as we progressed, and got closer together both physically uh, in command headquarters staffs. Uh, we also got closer together as individuals and personally. Uh, I think George may have always harbored a little resentment that I had gained promotion over him. Uh, but if, it, if there was resentment, he certainly never showed it to me. So my relationship with him was good. I worked through circumstances brought about by the president with his request, but it came out all right, I think, in the end. Karen uh, says, I see you wear your wedding band on your little finger. Why? Well, you get the call of the night. This is not a wedding band. I do not wear a wedding band. This is a ring worn by graduates of West Point in engineering. It's a symbol of the engineering majors at West Point, the, the United States Military Academy, and that's why I wear it. I got it uh, when I graduated from the academy, and I have worn it ever since. Many people think it's my wedding ring, but I do not wear a wedding ring. Rich says two questions about the Battle of Lookout Mountain. First, you were quoted as having said, there was no such battle and no action even worthy of being called a battle of Lookout Mountain. Is that quote accurate? And if so, please explain your thinking and perspective when having said this. You sound like Secretary Stanton and President Lincoln both asking me the same question. That, that quote is as accurate as one can reasonably attribute to journalists. Uh, sometimes they do not print the truth. They print what they want to be the truth or what they want you to think to be the truth. I hope that's a temporary thing during the madness of this war and it goes away. Uh, but that's, that's close. I, I did not think that the battle above the clouds, it, really, it wasn't a battle above the clouds. Uh, there are some few thousand feet elevation closer maybe a few hundred feet elevation of Lookout Mountain. <clears throat> and the, the, the weather that day fogged over. So where the fighting took place, what little there was, uh, was above the view because of the, the clouds that came in. We uh, were pushing up the side of the mountain in what would seem to be impossible uh, to climb. But you have to remember, the rebel gunners at the top of Lookout Mountain couldn't depress, literally, they couldn't depress their guns down enough 
to have any impact on my men coming up. The guns were arcing over them. So all of that artillery that they felt was so strategically placed was worthless. Uh, there weren't that many Confederate troops up there. I don't recall the specific numbers, but it was a small force at the top. Braxton Bragg had called in Longstreet. Longstreet didn't want to be there. Uh, and attitude has a great deal to do with performance. Uh, but Longstreet did not want to be sent there. Jefferson Davis, and I'm backing up a bit to give you the, the wider perspective, wanted Lee to go down and, and uh, fight. Well, Lee backed up and, and said, no, I'm, I must stay here in Virginia. He, but he did send Longstreet. Well, Longstreet didn't want to go either. Uh, neither did Joe Hooker. And see, that's the, the Chattanooga campaign is the only time in the war that there were units from both sides, Hooker Federal, Longstreet Confederate, that were both detached from the uh, Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia and sent to the Western Theater. Neither man wanted to be there, and his performance showed it. But uh, Hooker's pushing up that mountain. Bragg had, the day before, called Longstreet up there on that promontory, I think Garrity's, McGarrity's, Battery, Garrity. Uh, forgive me if I do not remember the Confederate gunner's name, but Garrity's battery is right on the lip along of the, of the mountain uh, there at Point Lookout. Longstreet summons, uh, or is summoned by Bragg. Longstreet cannot abide Bragg. Uh, can't stand it. And he drug his sword getting up there. Uh, which chagrined Bragg, and if you know anything about Bragg, he didn't need to be chagrined any more than he woke up in the morning being chagrined. So he is uh, jacked up. Longstreet's jacked up, and, and Bragg is pointing down at my forces there at Brown's Ferry in environs, saying, those men must be moved. Longstreet, as I understand, says something like, I expect so. Uh, Bragg said, go attack them and move them. Longstreet said, all right, and left abruptly. Well, it was the next day before Longstreet did anything. It, it, all that day, he did nothing. Uh, when they finally did attack, uh, the fellow that was at uh, Little Big Top, uh, Little Big Top, uh, I said Little Big Top, Little Round Top, that attack was captured. The Alabama Colonel, Colonel Oates, I think, he's out. He's been paroled, and he's back fighting at Lookout Mountain. Another reason I don't like paroles, but uh, he got his Alabama boys and uh, they put up some kind of pitiful fight. They didn't want to be there either. So it was scattered. It was disjointed. Uh, they did it. Our forces did achieve a feat that they went up and pushed the rebels off the top of the mountain. But you're talking about a small force that had no spirit to fight and they went back down the mountain, the back of the mountain, in the incline into North Georgia, Oglethorpe, Georgia, around Chickamauga. So I didn't think that the battle rated the uh, uh, hullabaloo that it got. Uh, the battle above the fall all day above the clouds. It was not tremendous forces involved. There were not. So it, it's a man died and suffered on that mountain. And that is not to be made light of, but the, it was not a significant, tremendous battle above the clouds as the journalists would have you believe. Quotes correct, and that's what happened. Rich continues, secondly, out of curiosity, did you personally observe the lunar eclipse the night of November 24, 25, 1863? And if so, what is your recollection of visibility during the event and its impact on activities? Well, there's a short answer to that, no. So I, beyond that, and, and I do not make a lot of your question. It is a good question, but no, I didn't. I, I was busy, far too busy uh, doing other things. It was a dark night. Beyond telling you it was a dark night is all I could, can say. I, I would love to tell you I saw it and was moved by it and did great things militarily under the cover of the artificial darkness it brought about, but I did not. Frank asks, as best as you can remember, can you tell us 
what you remember happening on Orchard Knob during the Battle of uh, Missionary Ridge and with whom? <laughs> I remember several things about the Battle of Orchard Knob. Best I say nothing about most of them. Uh, I remember I, General Granger, uh, whom I think was commanding a division, at least a regiment, uh, but General Granger was there and uh, General George Thomas was there. Now the, the original order was that our troops were to go to the foot of the mountain. There were three rows of rifle pits, one at the foot, one a little higher up and one up near where they had the artillery placed near the, the crest of the ridge or the top of the ridge which is very narrow at the top. It must not be 100, 150 feet wide at the very top of Missionary Ridge at that north end where Bragg had his headquarters. Uh, but the order was take the first line of, of rifle pits and hold. Well, they uh, some several 14,000, I think, troops swept across that short open field between Orchard Knob and, and Chattanooga Creek and up to the first row of lice rifle pits and the Rebs for the most part skedaddled. Well, they ran in, our forces ran in, jumped in the rifle pits and uh, they, they got their blood up and uh, they decided, well, we're gonna keep moving. And they kept moving. And then they went up to the second row in the middle of Missionary Ridge and began fighting furiously. And uh, I, I was disturbed because I did not want to have a defeat. And I, I turned to, to George Thomas and I said, who ordered that charge? And George rather snappishly turned to me and said, well, I certainly did not been here with you all day. Well, I called for couriers and I sent some couriers to stop that attack. I told him, you, you catch those commanding officers and stop that attack, hold where you are. Well, they, they galloped off. I don't recall how many of them, two or three of them, went off. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking we're about to suffer a defeat, quite possibly. Well, those troops had been bottled up uh, way back since September at that Chickamauga, September 19th, 20th at Chickamauga. And this is late November. And uh, they, they were ready for a fight. They'd been well equipped, re-equipped, well supplied, and they wanted a fight. Well, they took that second row of trenches. I sent more couriers because they kept on going. And I understand there's some Wisconsin lieutenant, a 20 year old, I found out who he was, a 20 year old, Arthur MacArthur. And he supposedly, as I'm being told, grabbed the colors and held them forward and turns around to his Wisconsin regiment and yells on Wisconsin and proceeds up the hill against my orders. I sent more couriers, stop that charge. And I growled again at George Thomas and he growled back at me uh, and they were proceeded to uh, move up to the top of the ridge. Now, meanwhile, General Granger is walking back and forth, helping gunners sight their guns. And I've been watching that and, and I finally had, I, I kept waiting for him. He had orders to move, to join in the fray and help secure that first line of trenches or rifle pits. And I was waiting for the man to go about his orders. He never did. And I finally said to him, don't you think it would be better if you were to take your command and obey your orders and move against the enemy instead of being a commanding general level officer citing particular specific artillery pieces here at the back, at the back of the lines? I chomped him. I hit him hard. And he said rather stiffly, well, yes, I, I, I suspect so. He said something polite and he left. So I was not happy with General Granger 
staying back and helping gunners sight guns. That, that, that was a job you got through with many years ago before you ascended to general level rank. So th those, well, and finally when they swept over the top and took Missionary Ridge and Bragg goes down the other side on a run just ahead of our troops uh, and with uh, Patrick Cleburne, he was there and uh, they, they were skedaddling down the other side of Missionary Ridge when we were taking the west side of it as they went down the east side. Then I sent, just as frantically, I sent messengers back saying, belay those orders, cancel, cancel those orders that I sent out earlier to stay in place. And, and so I, I was trying to cancel that. I, I still to this day, at least officially, I do not know what couriers got to whom to give which orders, but we took Missionary Ridge. So Karen asks, I understand you uh, write your orders in a clear and concise manner. Do you enjoy writing and did you learn to write so well at West Point? No and no. Uh, no, I don't enjoy writing. Uh, I have been asked to, to write articles and I've always steadfastly refused. I've been in, uh, asked, in fact, to write my memoirs. I will never write my memoirs. You'll never read anything I ever wrote. Uh, I, my reply to that is all these other fellows are writing all their memoirs and articles and newspapers and, and journals. Uh, there's plenty being said about the war. I don't need to add my voice to the cacophony. Uh, I will never write anything. And uh, I don't enjoy writing. I didn't learn how to write at West Point, uh, the, the concise orders. I've always been a person of few words. And uh, if you don't have anything to say, don't say it, frame of mind. I had witnessed uh, General Zachary Taylor, old rough and ready in the Mexican War, the first year or so that I was there. And I saw General Taylor, and he did two things that I greatly admired and I emulate. He wrote all of his own orders, and he wrote them as simply and as concisely as he could. He exercised a beautiful form of verbal economy. And I liked that. When you read General Taylor's orders, there was no question as to what you were expected to do. And I, I have always, when I was in a position to write an order, even as a lieutenant and a quartermaster, I emulated uh, General Taylor. I write as simply as possible because I know that you've got to write an order where the man receiving it has no, no doubt what you want him to do. And that's the essence of writing an order. Leave no doubt in the mind of the reader what he is expected to do or not do. So that's how I came about writing. Don't enjoy it. Uh, the Academy, I did I had to do some writing in the Academy, but and that, that certainly helped. Uh, but that's why I write as simply as I do. I'm not a gifted writer. But that's why I refuse to write anything. I tell people now, I'm not going to write anything about the war. It's all in Badeau. Adam Badeau wrote a three-volume series on me, Grant, in war. If you want to read about what I did, read Badeau. It's all there. Fernando asks, uh, who were the politicians who played in your favor during the Civil War years? And who did visit you in your cottage during those days while you were writing your memoirs, uh, I only know Simon Bolivar Buckner. General Longstreet uh, paid me a visit and uh, uh, Governor, I'm proud to say, Governor Buckner of Kentucky uh, paid me a visit when I was here. Uh, his first wife had died. They'd been married for many years <clears throat> and uh, Simon's first wife died and he remarried and he was in his uh, early 60s at the time. He'd been governor of Kentucky. He was now a newspaper editor, owner and editor. 
uh, and he remarried uh, a young lady, I believe she's 23 years old. And he was honeymooning in Niagara Falls, which is not too far from where I am here at uh, Drexel McGregor Cottage. And uh, Simon came by and, and paid me a visit. So Longstreet and Buckner, other, other people came, but no one of note who comes to mind. I, I don't want to try to name anyone because I will leave someone out and, and that would only un, unnecessarily hurt feelings. E. Smith says at the start of the war, what were your views on black soldiers and did it evolve as the war went on? Well, I had no view at all on black soldiers when the war started. Nobody, nobody entertained any views on black soldiers. That, that was something that just didn't happen. Now, there were some black sailors in the Navy, but uh, they were all um, free men of color. Uh, when the war started in 61, it did not start to free slaves. That, that's an unintended result. Uh, so I, I didn't at that time have any opinion on black soldiers. If you had asked me, I would have said there are no black soldiers and, and there aren't going to be. Well, in, uh, on January 1st of 63, the Emancipation Proclamation took effect. And there was also the Enlistment Act back in 62 that had been passed. It paved the way for free men of color to become soldiers. And, uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation uh, ending slavery in those territories in rebellion against the United States, well, that means any areas in which there were federal armies that had taken uh, occupation, then the blacks were there, there were free thereby. And uh, they, they began to uh, want to join the army. It was made possible for them to become soldiers and free black men or former slaves then became soldiers. I had my doubts, I had my questions. And the universal question was, will the black man fight? Because remember, you're dealing with people who have been enslaved and completely out of control of their own lives. Slaves have never had to make decisions about what to do or how to do it. They, in fact, by law, were not even allowed to learn to be to read and write and be literate. So you've got men who, uh, it, it, weeks ago, if not months ago, but even weeks ago, you've got men who are now free. They weeks ago they were slaves. They are now wanting to be United States soldiers. They've never had to make a decision on their own, and we were all wondering, will the black man fight? And uh, I was hoping they would, uh, because we need the we need the extra bodies. Some 180,000 uh, black soldiers enlisted in the United States Army, but out of that 180,000, only about 10 percent actually got to shoulder muskets and get into combat. So you're talking about 18, 20,000 uh, black men who were in combat, and they acquitted themselves with distinction. They acquitted themselves well. So my opinion went from no opinion because the condition you're asking about didn't exist to, all right, now they can be soldiers, they're free, they should be free, they want to fight. Who else has got, no one has a better reason to fight than a, a man who was a slave to end slavery because when Lincoln issued the emancipation, the war became to end slavery. It became the focal point. So if you've got men who were slaves, they're the ones that, that have the most enthusiasm and reason to fight to end slavery. And those 18,000, 20,000 black men who fought distinguished themselves well in combat. So my opinion went, for, will they fight to? Yes, they'll fight. And then it escalated to, and they'll fight well. So that's how my opinion about with and for black soldiers changed. Michael uh, says, was it your idea to go to total war against the Confederates? Yes. I had learned under Winfield Scott and Zachary Taylor as well in the Mexican war, if you destroy the ability of a country 
to feed and clothe and field troops, then you will win the war because that will take troops out of the field and uh, protect civilian lives zealously, but take away that, that ability to make war. And that was my, I had seen that work and be most effective in Mexico. Now, Winfield Scott, while he's saying destroy the ability to make war, he's also emphasizing do not unnecessarily alienate these people because when the war is over, we're going to want to work with them. We, we're going to want to be neighbors with them to the south of our country. So do what we have to do to destroy the capability to make war, but do not unnecessarily create hard feelings that will cause problems after the peace is secured. And I thought the same thing applied with the South. And uh, I came after Shiloh, really, I came to the feeling we need to destroy the South's ability to make war. Uh, and that's how and why I did, how I did, what I did. Lynn asks, on the subject of monocacy, can you indulge us with your recollections of your meeting of generals in August 1864 at the Thomas Farm to replace Hunter with Sheridan? Oh, that was a, uh, an easily done uh, move in, in that actually General Halleck suggested replacing Hunter with Sheridan. And I said, Sheridan's an infantry commander. Uh, I retorted perhaps a bit too sharply. And uh, because I was accustomed to Halleck not listening to what I said, even though I was now his superior officer. Uh, and I said, Sheridan is an infantry commander. And I had met Sheridan once before in Corinth, Mississippi, right after we had taken Corinth, uh, after the, the glacial march of 20 miles in 30 days from Pittsburgh Landing to Corinth at 20 miles. And the great uh, hoo-ha that did not happen because the Confederates evacuated and Halleck is standing there looking at an empty town and he's thinking he's gonna have, uh, he said a, a battle, I think he told the Secretary of War something to the effect of a battle of cataclysmic proportions or the mother of all battles and there was no battle. They had Quaker guns logs painted black pointing out the, the breastworks at us. It, it was all a, a, a hollow paper tiger. But in my entry into the town and, and spending time in the village of Corinth, uh, it's a miserable little village. Uh, the only thing there is the railroad crossing. I was walking, I was with Rollins and I walked into a particular building, don't recall which one, doesn't matter. And as I stepped in the door, Phil Sheridan, Little Phil, and he really doesn't like you to call him Little Phil. He's he's five four on a good day, or if he's got his cavalry boots on. Uh, in fact, they men joke about him. He, he there are two huge cavalry boots, and there's a little feller in there in between them somewhere. Uh, but Sheridan was stepping. Of course, I don't tease him like that. But Sheridan was stepping out the door when I went in the door, and we collided. And I stepped back and, and uh, I beg your pardon, and uh, Sheridan started to snap something at me and he thought, uh, he saw up here who I was and he thought better of snapping at me about being clumsy. Uh, look where I'm going. And uh, I said, uh, Colonel Sheridan, I knew something of him. I would like to invite you to stay here and, and join my staff. And Sheridan immediately said, hell no, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to uh, transfer to the Eastern Theater and go get into some fighting. And I said, uh, as you will, Colonel, uh, as you will. Uh, good luck to you. And he walked off down the sidewalk with those big cavalry boots clanking on the boards. And Rollins was standing there next to me and he looked at me and he said, I'd court-martial him for that insubordination. And I said, oh, he's all right, Rollins, he's all right. He just, he, he just wants to fight. 
Well, and he'll go back east, and I suspect he'll get all the fighting he wants. Well, when you get to that meeting there uh, that we had, I was not happy with Hunter. I, I needed to see more performance in the Shenandoah Valley and with our cavalry. But I said that Sheridan is an infantry commander, and Halleck said, well, if he's a good leader of infantry, doesn't it stand to reason he'll be a good leader of cavalry? And I think he's intimated something about, aren't you a, weren't you in the infantry? Now you're working with the cavalry? Kind of to the side, you know. Uh, and I said, your point's well taken, General Halleck. And we called up Sheridan to replace David Hunter and put him in command of the cavalry. And it was one of the best moves I ever made. He, now, Sheridan is a short-tempered, rude, ill-mannered individual, uh, but he is a fighter of the first degree, and I know it, and I need him on my staff, so I replaced Hunter with Sheridan. He would like to know, why did you take your 12-year-old son with you on the Vicksburg campaign, and gee, how did you convince Julia? Well, I didn't have any choice. Julia sent him with me. Julia had to convince me to take him with me. I didn't have to take convince her. Uh, she said, you should take Fred. I said, I'm going into enemy territory on campaign and it may be dangerous, Julia. And she said, Liz, take him with you. If the boy is with you, will it not be much like uh, Alexander the Great of uh, going with his father, Philip of Macedonia? And I, of course, I was taken aback. I knew Julia had a good education. Most women don't, but I was taken a bit aback on my heels about her throwing Alexander the Great and Philip of Macedonia at me. Uh, and will it not be like that? Will, will Fred not be out like Alexander the Great? He has the opportunity to see many things that most people, certainly most soldiers, will never have the opportunity to see. And I think you should take him with you. You'll take care of him. Fred will be all right. And I thought about my mother when I was three years old, swinging on the tail of that huge dray horse, uh, swinging back and forth on his tail. And mother's friends saying, this is going to get kicked. He's going to get killed. And my mother saying, oh, he'll be all right. Horses just seem to understand, Liz. And Julia was telling me pretty much the same thing about Fred. So I took Fred with me. Now, Fred did get hit by a ricochet from a sniper shot across the Big Black River as we were pushing Pemberton back into Vicksburg. Now, uh, hit him in the leg. It, it, it hurt him, didn't injure him, it hurt him. Uh, broke the skin, a little blood. Uh, of course, he was on the ground flopping around like a fish on a riverbank saying, I am killed, I am killed. And, uh, his, I think Brawlin said, you're going to live, Fred. He flipped him over every which way he could see to find a wound. He said, oh, you're going to be okay, Fred. Get up and let's go tell your father what happened. But more serious than that, Fred caught a, a bug, as many soldiers did, that uh, he never got rid of or did not get rid of. Uh, and it, well, he went back to St. Louis uh, and because he was sickly and nearly died. And it was in uh, February that uh, Julia sent me a telegram said, if you want to see Fred alive, you need to get home as soon as possible. But he beat that. If that was dysentery that he'd caught back in July in Vicksburg. So wounded by a sniper, the trots and, and dysentery, narrowly escaping death. Uh, I dare say Fred would credit all that as a great experience. Barbara would like to know, how long did your family live in Burlington, New Jersey? We didn't actually live there. We had our summer cottage there and we spent, we spent summers there. And after I left the White House, we, we still spent summers there. So we were the, the seasonal residents. We spent many happy months there on the seashore. Frank would like to know, why do you feel the victory at Stones River and the Tullahoma campaign were of little importance. I don't see where it accomplished much. Uh, Rosecrans, 
uh, and, and Bragg fought a, a terrible battle there the last couple of days of 62 into the first day of 63. It was one of the, it is one of the bloodiest battles of the war. Stones River is one of those battles that does not get its due. It was a, a frantic fight there on the banks of the Stones River, uh, just a few miles uh, southeast of Nashville, Tennessee. A lot of men lost their lives, and I, I thought then, and I think now unnecessarily, uh, because Bragg, it was pretty much a, a draw, but Bragg pulled back into around Winchester, Tennessee, and Shelbyville, Tennessee, uh, and falling back south in a southeasterly direction. But he went into camp and it was months. He said they sit there for months and uh, Rosecrans would not move against him. Rosecrans could have moved against Bragg and crushed him, uh, certainly in, in uh, another battle, but he didn't want to have another Stones River uh, or in detail if he'd done some effective maneuvering, but he frittered away an opportunity to crush Bragg's army. And he, he did not. And when he finally did get in movement to go against Bragg, Bragg was like that spider in the parlor who says to the fly, step into my parlor, because he kept falling back. And Rosecrans is thinking, I got him on the run. And he fell back some more. He goes down around Chattanooga. Bragg is poking and prodding him. I got him now. I got him on the run. And what Bragg was doing is fortifying and solidifying forces and moving down around Chickamauga Creek, around Oglethorpe, Georgia, and set one of the best traps in the war for Rosecrans. And Rosecrans didn't just walk into it. He hurtled himself headlong into one of the bloodiest battles of the war at Chickamauga Creek. Uh, so... I think it was a wasted campaign. If Rosecrans had moved faster and done something with the semi-victory that he had at Stones River, it would have been, I, I think I would have felt differently, but as it played out, Rosecrans lost an excellent, he threw away an excellent opportunity. Robert would like to know, did the general know about the Grand Review in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania? And if so, why didn't you attend? I wasn't aware of that. And I, and I still can't speak to that. If I had been aware of it, there would have been some participation. I would not ignore a grand review. That would, to show the people back home our appreciation and show them their, their boys had fought for them. But uh, I don't recall why I didn't hear about that and uh, why I didn't participate. Roger says, Sir, on April 12th, 1865, you went to speak with the president. Weren't you at City Point that morning? Well, I took a packet boat up to uh, Washington City. It didn't take long to get there. I had to go back into City Point and then went north into Washington City. So John says after the Battle of Iuka in October 1862, Rosecrans had orders from you to go after Van Dorn's troops, but did not. Did that add to your reasons for relieving him after you accepted your orders from Secretary Stanton to go to Chattanooga? Of course. I had the Battle of Iuka had uh, two phenomena. One was the, the uh, acoustic cloud effect that uh, I was there in Burnsville, Mississippi, just a couple of miles from Iuka. And uh, the orders were that we were going to attack, Ord was there, and Ord and I were going to move against uh, Van Dorn and Price when we heard the guns of the battle. And uh, because of the clouds that day, we didn't hear the guns of the battle. So, uh, Rosecrans was left a bit in the wind with that. He kept expecting us to come, but we didn't hear to come. We didn't know to come. I was frustrated with uh, Rosecrans because I thought, why are you not fighting? Well, he was fighting and fighting desperately. At the end of the day, I moved into the town and, and to have a, 
a discussion with General Rosecrans and found out what had happened. And I told him, all right, tomorrow morning at first light, pursue Price and, and uh, uh, Van Dorn as they retreat. Well, during the night, Price takes his entire army right past Rosecrans' army in the darkness. Now, that's one of those questions that I, I consistently ask myself. How do you move an entire army of many thousands of men, horses, wagons, artillery, and you're just within a few hundred feet of the enemy and the enemy does not hear a sound? Now, I can understand clouds and acoustic shadow and winds blowing away from you that I don't hear the gunfire. I understand that. I don't like it, but I understand it. I don't understand an entire army moving within a few hundred feet and you don't hear a sound. Yeah. But the next morning I told Rosecrans to pursue, pursue Van Dorn and Price and he uh, stayed around the camp until I finally goaded him, let's get, let's get going. And I rode with him personally three miles to make sure he went in pursuit of the Confederates. And when I was satisfied that he would continue in pursuit, I turned around and went back to Iuka and Burnsville, and I found out that as soon as I got out of sight, Burr, uh, Rosecrans sat down, went into camp. So when I left, he stopped. Well, when I had the opportunity to relieve him of command from yet another uh, inextricable spot, apparently, that he'd gotten his army into, I took the opportunity to relieve him of further embarrassment. Frank would like to know, what were your objections of General Rosecrans being assigned to the Department of Missouri? For the same reasons I have just noted. He did, he did not need to be in a, in a responsible command. So Larry would like to know, which of your several war horses was your favorite and why? Uh, Cincinnati was my favorite. Uh, he, he's a big thoroughbred, about 18 hands high. He, he's a fame, he's, I dare say he's more famous than I am, the famous to be applied. Uh, I liked uh, Jeff Davis. He's my rocking chair. My, my, he's, he's an ugly animal for the most part, but he's got a really smooth riding. Jeff Davis is, is, just a smooth single movement and I suffer from hemorrhoids and when I'm, I'm suffering from the hemorrhoids they're hurting me badly. Jeff Davis is, is an excellent uh, animal to ride. Uh, I liked Kangaroo. Kangaroo was brought to me after the Battle of Shiloh. He would look like a wore out nag uh, and he was brought to me as a joke. Look at this animal we captured from the revs general. But I saw that he had potential and I said, he just needs to be cared for. I fed him, loved him and cared for him. And he became quite the animal. In fact, he is the animal uh, that, that there's talk about a statue being put up of me at Vicksburg. Uh, but he's the animal that I would be sitting on in that statue. Many people think it's Cincinnati at Vicksburg. It's, it is not, I'm sitting astride kangaroo. So I like Kangaroo, I like Jeff Davis, uh, like very much like Cincinnati. Uh, I like Fox. Fox was a good one. Fox was the horse I was riding at uh, Shiloh when he fell on me, but it wasn't his fault. He stumbled in the darkness. And I was riding uh, old Jack in, uh, when I went into Chattanooga the night of October 20th, I believe, uh, 63, uh, when went up, uh, the ridge, Waldron's Ridge, uh, to get into Chattanooga, that's, that's 60 miles. Uh, and Jack uh, is really sure-footed, except he slipped in the mud and fell on that left leg. You know, Fox has slipped in the mud at Shiloh and, and damaged my left leg and ankle, injured them. Jack fell on me uh, it, going into Chattanooga, injured again the leg and ankle. But those two incidents notwithstanding, Fox and Jack were good ones too. Sergeant Major says, sir, in a few weeks, the Shenandoah will conduct an analysis of the new market battle. 
can you describe your thought process of sending Siegel to the Valley or after? Did you feel you should have gone yourself? No, I, I, I didn't, Sergeant Major. Uh, good question. I didn't think that it, it never occurred to me that I should go into the Shenandoah. Fawn Siegel, a uh, German immigrant, uh, had uh, demonstrated some leadership qualities, and I, I didn't know that was a complaint that I had, or a complaint I had with going into the Eastern Theater was that I did not have time to learn my command staff. And I didn't know much about Franz Siegel. I, I didn't know much bad about him. And I don't think, I didn't think then, I don't think now that I should have to follow around behind somebody to see if they're doing what I've asked them to do. Uh, as it turned out, uh, another commander might've been a better choice but I don't think I'm to be faulted for making a choice before the man demonstrated I needed to make a choice. Uh, and uh, he, was, he was met with an equivalent size force. He had 5,500, 6,000. Breckenridge, former Vice President Breckenridge comes up with uh, about that many and the Virginia Military Institute cadets went out. And I will say this, it, it's not a good idea a hyperbole of understatement to say it is not a good idea to send a child into combat. But those cadets at Virginia Military Institute, they wrote their names in the Hall of Fame of warfare and battle. Those young men more than acquitted themselves and covered themselves in glory. Uh, but they, with Breckenridge, they've whooped, uh, they didn't just defeat, they've whooped Franz Siegel and he withdrew from the Shenandoah and my hopes of, of taking the Shenandoah away from Lee for a bread basket to feed the Army of, of Northern Virginia, those hopes were dashed. I was not happy. But then again, I wasn't happy with Ben Butler over on the James River getting 30,000 men bottled up in Bermuda 100. Uh, so there were, there were a few people I wasn't happy with, but that's what I had to say I expect about Siegel and, and New Market. Karen would like to know, why did you decide to retire in New York City after your White House years <laughs> instead of returning to the Midwest where the cost of living was considerably less and did Julia like the big, big city life? Well, I can work backwards from there. Yes, Julia liked the big city life. Julia is a bit She's not around. Julia is a bit of a diva. And uh, I, of course, that old expression, it, it, the contemporary happy wife, happy life. Uh, I, I'm not, I didn't get to be a general of the army being stupid. If my wife wanted to live in New York City, it was quite all right for me to live in New York City. We owned uh, a home in Philadelphia. We owned a home in Washington City. We owned a home in Galena. That and, and the, the home in Philadelphia and uh, Galena had been given to us. Uh, the one in Galena is a, a two-story, 3,500 square foot, five bedroom brick that was given to us by 13 businessmen in Galena. Uh, and we, we were there a bit. We never really lived there, but we were there some. Uh, and Julia wanted to live in New York City because it was the hub the hub of the world. And uh, I think Julia has some writing ambitions too. And of course, Pulitzer's there and Adolf Ox is there. And uh, it's a good place to be, just a real good. And, and Buck is there working in New York City. Fred's in the army and there's no telling where he's going to be. Uh, Nellie married Sartorus and he's over in, she's in England uh, with him. And Jesse, I don't really know what Jesse's going to do. So, and he's still with us. So New York City was a good choice. I'm, I'm perfectly content there. James uh, would like to know, what is your opinion of General Wilson and his maneuvers in June of 1864? He did, he did all right. I can't, I can't speak to that much. I'm not as familiar with that or uh, immediately off uh, the top of my head to give you a good answer about that. 
So I must pass. I will look into that matter. And uh, perhaps the next time we get together, uh, I will have a, a more complete answer with uh, General Wilson in 1964. But I must demur for this one. Ron would like to know, um, but isn't Chattanooga considered the death knell of the Confederacy? Yes, it is, uh, and perhaps it is. Uh, there, there are uh, many people who, with conviction, believe that uh, Fort Donaldson was the death knell of the Confederacy, uh, and others feel that Shiloh was and uh, still others feel that Vicksburg was, and then Chattanooga. Now, all four of those campaigns and battles have great merit, great merit for one to consider that they were the beginning of the end. Uh, I, I don't know which one uh, to urge upon anyone uh, but I will say my own, my personal feelings are that Fort Donaldson was the beginning of the end and that once we had captured Vicksburg, it, it was over for the Confederacy. Now, th maybe that's another way to say death knell. I would say that uh, Chattanooga sealed the fate. And, and I don't mean to be to, to manipulate words on the part of the query. Uh, because it is most legitimate and I honor it. But th th those four battles, Donaldson, uh, Shiloh, Vicksburg, and Chattanooga, all hold, uh, depending upon your own point of view, they all hold equal weight for what ultimately happened to the Confederacy. I should like to talk about that at length. Uh, but at the moment, I've said enough. Michael would like to know, what did you uh, think of General James S. Negley, and why was he blamed for failure at Chickamauga? Was he scapegoated? Don't know much about General Negley. The, the most I remember about him is he has that fort on top of that hill in Nashville named after him, Fort Negley. And uh, it was, it's, it is, it was then, uh, it still is the largest star fort in North America. I think it's the largest star fort in the world, but it's the largest star fort in North America, and it is still there. Uh, and it was, oddly enough, it was never involved in combat in the defense of Nashville, even though Nashville was taken. Uh, uh, George Thomas took it, and, and it was not retaken. Negley, that's all I can say about Negley because that's another individual about whom I do not know much. And I, I cannot and should not hazard a statement about him, but I will look into his uh, war record and address him at a future date. So I need to, to look at uh, General Wilson and I need to look at General Negley. And I will, uh, at one of our future meetings, I will address them in more detail. Joanne asks, were you able to spend any time with Julia during the war years? Oh, yes. I, I spent uh, about 50% of the time during the war years with Julia. She uh, traveled, she, she reckons, and I do not argue, she reckons that she traveled at least 10,000 miles. And that's by a riverboat, rail, army wagon, ambulance, carriage, buggy, flatbed wagon uh, to be with me when conditions permitted. And uh, she always had at least one child with Jesse, our youngest, was always with her. Sometimes the other three were in school uh, in either St. Louis or up in New Jersey, but uh, she always had one to four children and she spent about 50% of the time with me in the war. Ron says, greetings from Virginia. I would assume the highest, uh, the height of your military career was April 9th, 1865. But what would you consider the opposite, if any of your career from a personal standpoint? Cold Harbor. I would say Cold Harbor 
was the absolute nadir for me in the war. Cold Harbor and the charge there at uh, Vicksburg against the Great Redan uh, on May 22nd of 63. Those, those two moments are two decisions that I, I bitterly regret having made, although I made them at the time under the best information that I had with the best wishes and tents that I had. Uh, both turned out to be debacles with great loss of life with nothing uh, uh, militarily achieved to compensate in any way for the losses we sustained. So I would rank May 22nd to 63 at Vicksburg and June the 30th, 64 at Cold Harbor as the nators of my Civil War career as the uh, opposite of Lee surrendering on April 9th of 65. Sergeant Major would like to know, what is the least known fact about you at Donaldson? Fortunately for me at Donaldson, the least known fact is that I didn't leave anybody in command on the morning of the 15th when I went to meet with Flag Officer Foote. Uh, I had told McClernand, specifically McClernand, uh, not to bring on an engagement. And all of the, the commanders in that field, in that ring around Confederate defenses. Uh, the problem was, for me, I found out, while I told them not to bring on an engagement, I neglected, and I told them I was leaving the field to go visit Flag Officer Foote on his flagship, the St. Louis, on the Cumberland River. I didn't tell anybody that anybody was in charge. So when uh, the Confederates demonstrated that they had a, an agenda different from my own at the battle uh, and came out of those trenches and attacked us, uh, there, was, there was actually a situation where command staff and rank alike were looking at each other and saying, who's in charge? And people saying, I don't know, I thought you were. And that doesn't make for a cohesive resistance of a heavy onslaught of the enemy. But fortunately, Lou Wallace uh, came in, uh, he disobeyed my orders or the lack of orders about not bringing engagement and not leaving anybody in charge. He came in on McClernand's flank, stopped the flow from uh, Pillow's men, Gideon Pillow's men coming out, and they retreated back into their trenches. So that's not a well-known, the fact that I didn't leave anybody in command is not well-known, and that's the best thing about what I did or didn't do at Donaldson that isn't a well-known fact. Uh, Douglas uh, says, taking nothing away from General Meade's performance at Gettysburg, do you think of any missed opportunities that you might have exploited had you managed this battle? Well, it, this, my reply skirts on conjecture. And you know, I think I've made it clear how I feel about conjecture, the parlor game that adults play when they talk about something about which they, they have absolutely no stake in it, the outcome. But had I been at Gettysburg, I would have pursued Lee uh, aggressively uh, more, and, and uh, Meade did not. But George had good reason, and I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to defend George. I'm merely going to state what his situation was because I have a parallel in my experience. George did not pursue Lee because he'd only been in command of the Army of the Potomac for just a few days when he's engulfed in the largest battle of the war. And after that battle, his soldiers, his Army of Potomac, was absolutely exhausted and mauled. But so was Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. And Meade did not, decided not to pursue Lee. I had the same parallel after Shiloh. Uh, and after we had had two days of Southern hospitality, 
to the extent of uh, some 14,000 men killed and wounded in 36 hours, uh, I was more than happy to let the Confederates fall away from Shiloh and take their hospitality with them. And I was bitterly criticized for not pursuing. Uh, later in the war, I did not let uh, what I now view as an opportunity to escape me. And I, I pursued the enemy aggressively. And when I was told by my junior officers, but our men are tired, I would always reply, their men are just as tired as yours. Pursue them. And uh, Meade did, he, I think Meade was in the same position after Gettysburg that I was after Shiloh. And I do not take him to task for what he did not do. Richard says, please briefly discuss your motivations, thoughts, and intent when issuing General Order Number 11 of 12 December 1862 during the Vicksburg campaign and your reaction to President Lincoln's countermanding of it a few weeks later. <clears throat> well, I can start from the back and work forward. My reaction to President Lincoln's countermanding of the effort of the order was yes, sir. Uh, I, I issued that order in uh, anger at uh, not the Jews. I am not an anti-Semitic man at all. Demonstrated that clearly before orders number 11 and for many years after orders number 11. I did not issue, even though I said, unfortunately, I worded that as the, uh, the Jews as a class are to be expelled. Uh, that was a mistake that I have freely admitted many times. Even Julia, before I issued that order said, don't do this. You're going to regret issuing that order. And I paid no attention to her. Uh, what had happened was there were three uh, Jewish businessmen in, uh, I believe it was Columbus, Kentucky, who had contacted my father, Jesse, and said, we want to uh, get with you and get with your son, General Grant, who was the commander at that time of the, the entire district, much of the Western theater, but I was in Memphis. And uh, we want you to go down there with us and prevail upon your son to let us take the cotton that is standing on all those docks up and down the Mississippi River and on those plantations already bailed and sell them. Well, the first problem with that is that that cotton selling it was illegal. It was prop, uh, contraband of war. And the US government was getting it to sell it to raise money to pay for the war effort. But private sales of confiscated Southern cotton was absolutely forbidden. I had been having a great deal of trouble with that in the Memphis area of skullduggery and backhanded dirty dealings going on and people making fortunes selling rebel cotton for the gold that it brought. And uh, I, I was tired of that. It was a fire that I couldn't stomp out. Well, I get a call from my father. He, uh, aide says, your father's outside and wants to see you. Well, I was overjoyed. Uh, that father had come down to visit with me. I wasn't expecting him, certainly was un unexpected. So he, I said, absolutely, bring father in. So he comes in, but these three fellows come in with him. And he introduced me to them, and I don't recall their names, uh, but they had a, a large business uh, in Kentucky. And father tells me, that he wants me to give him permission to sell the cotton through them and that they were going to give father a percentage of the sales. I was flabbergasted. I was astounded. I was floored and I was absolutely furious. I was able to contain my anger long enough to tell my father, do you not understand that what you're asking me to do is forbidden by federal mandate, that I've got orders from the president 
to stop selling cotton through individuals and you're coming in my office in front of these individuals saying you want me to allow you to do underhanded dirty dealing uh, selling of cotton because you're going to get a cut now you you hold on just a minute father i yelled for an aide to come in called for the uh provost marshal i told the provost marshal you take these three men here and escort them to the dock put them on the first boat going north and i don't care what boat it is and i don't care where they are going you make sure that they're on that boat and watch it pull away from the dock. If they come back, immediately slap them in prison and let me know well after the fact. And I turned them and, and they were escorted hurriedly out of my office. And I told my father, he got up to us, I said, no, you sit back down, you sit down. And I tore him up one side of his waistcoat and out the pocket of his frock coat. I forevermore told him, don't you ever come back in here and try to get me to do something illegal. I'm the commanding officer of this federal district, and you're sitting in front of outsiders and telling me you want me to give you permission to steal from the federal government under my name. Now, you get out of here and get on the first boat north, and I don't care where you're going. And I threw him out. Well. Order number 11 resulted from that because I was so angry at my father and I couldn't take it out on my father. And unfortunately, at the time, the Jews were the whipping boy of society. And I vented, I took it out on the Jews. I didn't take it out on my father. I should have had him arrested for the very idea he brought before me, but I didn't. He was my father, but I made the foolish mistake decision of exercising my wrath against the Jews simply because societally at that time, it was all right, or so I thought. Now, Julia was correct when she said, you're going to regret that because those men, two of those men, I believe, they immediately telegraphed President Lincoln. I've got about what I'd done. When the order came out, uh, I think it was Colonel Oglesby, who was in Jackson, Tennessee at that time, just 90 miles from Memphis. He got that order, and I will quote him what men with him heard him say. And he said, I'm not throwing anybody out of my district in Jackson. I joined the damned army. I did not join a church and I will not follow this order. Fortunately, he didn't. Now, when President Lincoln got the telegraphs, many telegrams, he was aghast. He immediately rescinded that order through General Halleck to me. And uh, uh, I, I had already, Halleck had already gotten to me about rescinding it. But it was a very foolish mistake. I vented my wrath against my father on the Jews because they were the whipping boy of society. I shouldn't have done that. I have been apologizing for it ever since. And I expect I will always be sincerely apologizing because I'm not anti-Semitic. I just took out anger at my father against the Jews. General, we are, we have run out of time. We are running out of daylight. And <laughs> it's getting dark here on Mount McGregor. It, it is, and, and you're getting fuzzier and fuzzier. And um, uh, we have uh, a number of, a small number of questions. I will forward those to you with the, uh, with the email addresses of the uh, person that asked them. And, uh, and I wanna thank you so very much for, for meeting with us tonight from Mount McGregor and, uh, and telling us uh, the real way that it, uh, that it is and the way that it was. Support Mount McGregor, look 
look up uh, what you may on the New Telegraph. Let them know that you now know of them, like and follow them, support them. You may tell them that uh, General Grant ordered you to report and uh, support our history, particularly this time capsule in history. It's so important and they here need all of you out there. Daz, even uh, our friends in the UK, uh, please tap on the telegraph keys and let them know you know about them, you've heard about them and you wanna support them. I would consider it from all of you a personal favor. All right, well, thank you so very much. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us tonight. And uh, you know, next Friday, we're gonna have Fridays with Grant. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Have a great evening, everyone. Mm -hmm.